other arguments we've been looking at, and it's fascinating, these arguments have also been borrowed, second-hand, failed arguments from the UK, okay, is the reconfiguration and the centralisation of services. And managers in England have tried to persuade us we'd be better off with fewer hospitals delivering emergency services uh, and concentrating those services with fewer, bigger units. Now, you have bitter reason to know that that doesn't work in your area, and that, you know, that would mean ludicrous journeys, and it would mean patients dying on the way, and it will mean all the misery and suffering of people trying to visit relatives who've been admitted to hospital at long distances. You know, nothing works for local people in rural areas where you shut down the local. Nothing's to your benefit in that. Okay? But they say, oh, there's a clinical argument for it. There's a clinical argument that more lives could be saved. And so we looked at the case, and we looked at the figures, and we broke out what evidence is there that doctors have found this to be the case. And in fact, what is the case is that for 3 to 4% of patients admitted to hospital, with certain rare or very complicated conditions, it can be an advantage to take them to a more specialised centre. These are some extreme areas of neurosurgery where you have a major accident or something you need neurosurgical treatment, you need to be transported rapidly to a specialist centre where they have that type of expertise. Some types of paediatric surgery, you know, children, school children, specialised areas of paediatric surgery, not all of it, but some of it, again, works better in a big centre. And some types of rare cancers. You know, I think this is a pretty obvious argument, you know. You'd pretty much rather, if you've got a rare cancer, you'd rather travel a bit further to a place where they've seen it before than watch your local doctor try to look it up in a book and, or oh, does it look like that, and does it feel like that? You know, you'd rather, somebody knew what they were doing, did that. So I don't think there's a big argument there, but that leaves 96% of people, routine hospital cases, for whom a smaller hospital close to hand is easily as good as a larger hospital further away. And for rural areas, that is the first choice, yeah? Let's make special arrangements for the 3%. Let's maybe put on some air ambulance or some other services to make sure that they can be taken rapidly to a specialist centre. I notice these plans that I've seen as we've been travelling across, none of them talk about transport. None of them talk about getting people swiftly to hospital for emergencies. They're keen enough to close down the A&E, the emergency, we call them emergency rooms here, don't we? We call them accident emergency units. Keen enough to close them down, but pretty slow to talk about how they're going to get people to the alternative services. How are they going to cope? Where are the resources going to go in to invest in expanding the hospitals that are supposed to take these thousands of extra patients? A massive silence. These are not serious plans to reconfigure and improve health services. These are plans to hack back health services, to pay the cost of P3, and to make, make up for the fact that this service, as Natalie has pointed out, drastically, massively, unfairly underfunded compared to the rest of Canada and most advanced capitalist countries. And that's a decision your government has taken, and your government has to come along and explain to you. And that's why they're hiding away from you. And that's why you won't, won't come and do it. So, basically, these type of things happen while people put up with them. People stand up and fight back, there's a chance of turning them around. Even the most shame-faced local M MPPs who don't want to face up to local people, if we make it a consistent enough element of the local press coverage, and they think about the next election coming up, eventually it might be persuaded to break cover and come and maybe find out what local people are saying. And might have an answer. So maybe that's what we need to do. That's what we try to do back home. We try combinations of people marching in the street, people meeting in, in gatherings like this, and constant pressure on the media to force people to explain themselves and come out and say what they really are planning and come out and argue to fill in the gaps that they've left in these plans and come out and explain why they can't consult people before they take decisions rather than afterwards and what use it is claiming you've consulted somebody after you've already decided to close the hospitals. So I wish you well. I'm really encouraged by this. I think you've got the basis here of a campaign that can fight and can save Matthews Memorial and your other hospital services here. But you're going to have to keep the pressure on. The sooner you stop the pressure, the sooner they'll feel it's safe to come back and make more cuts. Keep the pressure on, keep the fight up, keep your Medicare. Let's not go the American way and see it all slide into a...